Hey everyone, Troy Hammond here, and that means you're listening to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast. And on today's episode, we're chatting with Francis Valentine. Francis is the CEO and founder of Academy X. Previously, she actually set up the Media Design School, and off the back of that has built a bunch of companies which forms an Academy X right now. It's a phenomenal journey. It's a really cool chat you're about to hear. Someone that left home at 17, traveled the world on her own, moved to the UK, moved to Turkey, came back, set up a company, grew those companies, has been phenomenal in terms of information sharing and helping Aotearo and helping all these people that are now in positions around the world because of the education that Francis was a part of. I really, really enjoyed this chat and you're going to be in for a really amazing listen or watch and however you're consuming this podcast. And so strap in, Settle down, listen to this one from start to finish because you're really going to love it. Kia ora. Thanks for tuning in to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast, brought to you by Talent Army. I actually wrote a book which was published last year um, and I have a whole chapter it's a very much a book for female entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I talk about the Goldilocks effect that I was too young, too young, too young, too young, too old. Yeah. And I was like, where did I get that middle soft bed? <laughs> like, where did that yeah. happen? Where do, where do you, you know, you're too young to be a leader, you're too old to be in tech. Where does it come from? Does it come from the film industry? Like what, where does that shit know, thing come I from? I don't know. I think, I think it's probably more in tech than it is in other sectors. Yeah. There's an expectation that if you are a, you know, I'm a 51-year-old woman in tech yeah. who's at the front of their game. Like, that just doesn't exist. Yeah, wow. Don't, don't size 50. Don't, don't mention I'm 51. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, but that's the reality. Yeah. And probably I felt it from the time I was 45. Well, I say, I don't even think I was mature and smart enough until I hit 40, you know, to be yeah. able to make some big decisions yeah, on I business think. and life. And but it was literally a, a moment where I would, the conversation would go from, wow, you're really young to be a leader. And I was in my, you know, probably in my early 30s and yeah. you're really young to start businesses and you're really young to do this. And, and then it was like, wow, you're really old to be in tech. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what the hell just happened? Yeah, you move from a mentee to a mentor yeah, really quickly yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. like, oh, look, That did happen really fast. Yeah. yeah. Do you do much mentoring? Yeah, I do a lot. Yeah. 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 All, I, all females and, and, and not because, of, well, it's a bit of a feminist stance, I guess, but because I found it really hard to find female mentors when I was young. Yeah. And there's a lot more of them now, but I think there's still there's still a lot of women who um, are looking for a female mentor yeah. it's the, in the technology sector particularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, there's, uh, there's so many dudes out there, right? And like female heroes. Different. Yeah. Well, it's different in terms of fundraising particularly. Yeah. Like that's a really big difference in what you kind of experience. Is. What do you think the difference is in fundraising for a woman? Well, the the people across the other side of the table when you're looking for funding, yeah, are all men. Yeah, I mean, it's. Have you ever pitched to a female VC? So interesting enough, the most recent funding I got in March last year of a, a, a PE fund out of, out of Sydney, I went through twelve funds, and when I looked across those twelve funds, only one female was present, and there was probably six or seven investors in each virtual room I went into. Wow! And the one that had the females, the one I went with. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and you know it's it's interesting, and I've I've been to a number of talks recently when I've been on a panel or had a conversation, and people have challenged me on that. And sort of sort of said, yeah, but that's because there's not that many female businesses. And then when I went through that process a year ago, I went through PwC, and at the end of the whole process, I went back to them and said, can you just tell me how many female businesses of all the ones you've put through in the last year were successful in getting fundraising? Two out of a hundred. Wow. So it's a real thing. It's, you know, I think that there is sometimes the negotiations fall over because of a misalignment in terms of, you know, shareholding or valuation or yeah. expectation on their role. Yeah. But there's, it's really, it's quite, it's quite profound and, until you sit across the table and you look. And of course, that's, you know, going back to talking about age, it's really profound when you start looking how young some of these investors are. You know, they're representing yeah. funds and, you know, they're slick. They were really super slick, and, and even more so when you get outside New Zealand. I feel old when I'm talking to them because, <laughs> yeah. like the VCs, we work with a lot of VCs for recruitment purposes. Yeah. And I meet them, and they're like 25 years old, and, and they've like, like you know painted on shirts, and yeah. they've just come from the gym. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, I know, it's very and, intimidating. And you're like, what the hell? You know, and I mean, they're smart. Like a lot of them, are like, like ex-lawyers, and you know, like smart. super smart people. But 
I just felt old when I was chatting with most of them. And, yeah. yeah it's, and they're very driven in a, in a very, you know, and very non-Kiwi ambitious way. Yeah. You know, so that's then itself is a little bit like, you know, we're all, if, you, if you're in the entrepreneurial game, you're ambitious, but yeah. there's another type of ambition that comes with private equity and yeah. venture capital, I think, that yeah. you just don't see. Do you do any investing now yourself? Yeah, I do. Not not hugely. Um, and But all local, all sort of startup sort of stage and um, getting people going more than, without any expectation of returns. So yeah. helping out in that way is probably more my jam. That's my type of investment. I go, you can have this money. I'll probably never see it again, but I feel better yeah. about giving it And occasionally it, to you. it comes back and you yeah. reinvest it and things. And sometimes it makes a huge difference for someone getting off the ground and you think it may come back in a different way. You yeah. know, I sort of, they'll play it forward. And, you know, I think that, that I find really great enjoyment of doing and helping people at that really early stage when they just like got clearly a great idea, got, yeah. got the smarts but they, they just don't have the equity or the kind of the capital to, to go. I just need to hire a really good person. Yeah. When was that first time for you? When was that first time in your life that you were like something was buzzing around in your brain and you just had to get it out of you? In terms of an idea to start yeah, something? Yeah. Oh, in my teens. Yeah. And what was it? So I, uh, I went from uh, Tamaki Makoto to London at 17. I still don't know why. Like I still can't go back to that moment on a one-way ticket with no friends there. You know, this is pre-internet, pre-cell phone, pre-credit cards. And so... As a a father, if my 17-year-old daughter said to me, hey, Dad, I'm going to London, no credit cards, no for cell phone, I'd be like, the fuck you're not. (laughs) Yeah, well, this is the weird thing about it because my kids have come and gone past 17 and I was going at the time going, one, they would never have asked. They just, it just wasn't even on the radar. Mm. And, And two, if they had asked, I would have been the same. I would have been like... Hell no. Yeah, <laughs> no yeah, yeah. So I don't know what it was. I, I literally have gone back to that moment many times and said, Watch. But it would have defined your life. It right? totally defined my life. And I arrived in the late, very late 80s. So, you know, almost on the cusp of 90, 1990. And when I looked at what was going on in London, it was like the tech sector was just booming. Like mm. it was suddenly everything was digital and everything was tech and the big beige boxes that started arriving on everyone's desks. And I just was like smitten. Like this mm. idea that technology was going to to frame the future, and 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 you know people were starting to talk about the internet and multimedia was starting to be a thing, and people were talking about moving away from you know if you were in, in the in the sort of the design industry away from bromides and kind of like these high resolution f- photography files yeah. into digital, and and it just it was just the most exciting. So at that moment in time, I knew that somehow I was going to end up in in some form of technology. Did you have an uh like a, a, an entry into technology before that? No. So no, it, no, no. I mean, you know, I'm <laughs> the, the time when technology was not a, a subject. It was, mm. I, I, was a, I was a real tinkerer. Like I loved the idea of just kind of, you know, anything that was, I mean, even in early games of gaming, you know, handheld kind of devices and Game Boys and things. Like I was always that person. Yeah. Um, so I, I had that, but I mean, a, a personal computer was way outside my reach yeah. at that stage. It probably wasn't until I literally walked into companies that had a computer that I was like, wow, it's not this big, huge thing that sits in a room. It's actually something that someone personally can own. Mm. And um, So what was that idea then? Well, the, the idea was, I, I don't know if I was specific around what the idea was, but I knew that Tech. there was a, a, a technology that would be part of my future. And I knew I wasn't, a, wasn't going to be a hardcore someone in tech. Like I knew it, yeah. wasn't, it was going to be peripheral to that. But I knew I wanted whatever I did first was going to be taking something that was traditional and disrupting it with technology. Mm. That was, and and I, I think it wasn't really probably until, you know, a few years later when I started thinking about what that might be. And, you know, I had a kind of an interesting time living in Europe because um, – I left London after a year. It wasn't wasn't really, not not so much. It wasn't my jam. I just didn't like the weather, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I moved to Turkey to live there, and which was far more my jam. And yeah. but but if you look at what was going on then, so moved it, to Turkey at eighteen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, sounds all kind of a little yeah. crazy, uh, and some of the experiences, you know, I look back and I just go, "There's probably not one I'm going to tell my kids." You know, just and not not because it was it, it was just taking risks that by yeah. today's standards you wouldn't take. Yeah. You do, you, do you think, as parents, that we coddle model, coddle model, coddle model our kids? Model coddle. Model, mo- Molly, <laughs> Molly coddle. Molly coddle. Molly coddle. Molly coddle. <laughs> we'll our there. kids too much these days because I yeah. was the same. Like I moved out of home at sixteen. Yeah. I left school. I had to leave school early. Unfortunately, the family issues and likes. 
but and but I think it gave me such a good path to drive and succeeding because I had to, you know. And then these days now my kids, I'm I'd be scared if they move out of home before they're 22, 23. Honestly, I could, I told my kids 18. That's it. You yeah. know, you finish school 18. You, I'm you, sending you, you to Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, but you know, look, I do think we we have, we're putting too many levels of fear across our kids. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of kids who would do far better if they got independence earlier and made decisions that were just sort of free flowing and as opposed to the sort of the linear mm. get on the escalator and stay on and jump off where everybody else jumps off. And, um, you know, everyone I talk to and anyone probably from, you know, 40s through 50s and, and beyond will have memories of, you know, getting up in the morning, putting jumping on the bike and saying, I'll see you in a couple of days, mum, I'm going to go and see some friends and yeah. school holidays where... Didn't you know, you, 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 went, you went, went to a beach town, whatever yeah. one you had a, some kind of connection to, and your parents would see you at the end of, you know, two or three weeks when you yeah. made it home and with no contact. Yeah. You know, people would be mortified at the very idea that if their, you know, 16-year-old went to to the mount for three weeks without contact. contact mm. yeah. you know? So I think we have definitely um, created a, sort of an expectation of constant connectivity with our kids and... That means there's a safety net for them all the time, and I don't yeah. know. You can you can't really kind of create that. Fab you can't fabricate that because, of course, you have the technology. It means you can stay in touch. So you're not going to ignore the fact there is a phone where you can just text and say, "Just checking in." Yeah. So it's it's unfair to sort of turn around to parents today and say, "No, you should just not reach out to your kids because yeah. they can." I mean, yeah. back then you couldn't. So it wasn't. It was we were a product of our circumstances and our time. Mm. Interesting. Interesting topic we're on now. Like, say, we're talking about education of children, or you know, in some sort of weird segue there that I'm trying to get to. But you now find yourself in like something where you've got an education platform, which is trying to change the traditional structure and hierarchy <laughs> of university. Talk me through. How did you get to Academy X? Okay, so 1998. Uh, so I uh, strange a new story actually. I uh, so with with my mother, we formed Media Design School. Yeah. And so it was the first school in the country that really focused on high-end creative technology sector. So if you think around the film, animation, game industry, yeah. it, it became very quickly the, sort of the school, the pl place to go. And a lot of people in the first few years, you know, this is 25 years ago, were um, – migrating from analog to digital. So yeah. there were a lot of people sort of mid-career, suddenly were graphic designers and going, whoa, what's all this Photoshop and what are yeah. we going to do with Illustrator and multimedia were coming out and people were starting to use all of these, you know, Dreamweaver and, you know, all these, yeah. kind, of, these kind of new technology and new um, code. And so, you know, I, I'd, I'd taken that fashion, fascination with, with technology and when I'd landed back into New Zealand and going, how do we let people know about this? And... And at the time, my mother had been in travel industry, so this is not something in, in where she had been. But she was fascinated because not only myself, but my brother, who, who's you know been a video editor for years, he was trying to get into that sector, and he was trying. No one's teaching this stuff, mm. and so it really was spawned out of this idea that we didn't have an institute that was really designed for professionals to go and to do this stuff and and compress timeframes too. It wasn't about going and doing a three year degree. Mm. And so that was really it. And so I was there for 14 years. And when I left, three years before um, I left, um, I, the, the whole organisation was sold to an American organisation. So mm. I stayed on as the chief executive. And by that stage, you know, we were a, a, a pretty big force across particularly Asia Pacific around mm -hmm. that sector, particularly around animation and, and game development. Yep. And um, Is, Do you think, because like game development, like... It blew up here in New Zealand. Do you tie what you did to helping the industry flourish? I've we heard were certainly, yeah, the, the first, and, and I was on the Game Development Association and I was part hardcore in that games world. So the people yeah. that, you know, there was a group of us there, like um, Mario Winans and um, Maru Niho Niho and yeah. I and a whole bunch of other game kind of people who are either making games. And actually, if you go back to those days, in the early days, you know, pre Pickpocket was she interactive. Yeah. They were making Barbie games. Yeah. Like we were literally talking around the table at board meetings about, you know, licensing and getting access to dev kits, which were a million dollars just to get the dev kits to create a Barbie game. Wow. And it was all licensed work. No one yeah. was creating anything original. And so when when the the game development program started and there was a programming stream and an art stream. So there were 
there were two and actually I think it evolved over time even to a story stream. That was really it. Like if you wanted to go into games, unless you sort of went from a comm science software engineering pathway into it, it was the qualification. Mm. I'm sure there's more now. You know, I don't know. But I think there's a number of things that happen. I mean, we launched Media Design School at the same time they were looking to start the Lord of the Rings series in the trilogy and they needed a huge amount of 3D modelers, animators, riggers. And so the very first conversations were with Weta going, we need a whole bunch of people. We're currently bringing them all into the country. Can you can you actually develop this talent? Mm. So I was thrown into the sector, like just boots in, get in, and fully immersed in some of the funny conversations. I think back because we were having to parallel import Macs into the country because the cost to get them through the official channels was r- ridiculous, and there was a wait list of years. And so if you parallel imported through other countries – you could you could bring them, but they came with no warranties, and so you had this whole, you know, huge setup, startup budgets have been poured into technology, and these were expensive at the time. Mm. And then you kind of had this thing of like, if something goes wrong, no one's going to fix them because you've taken you, you haven't really got the proper channel to go there. It wasn't illegal; it just wasn't the official channel. Yeah. And and then when you put that aside, then the very first time we started getting three D files, and I think I remember the very first time someone produced a fifty meg file. And we were like, what do we do with it? Like the cost of an external drive was hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You couldn't back it up onto the computer because it was a shared computer because no one, no student had their own. Yeah. You know, no. it was way too expensive. So you had literally had labs of computers. No cloud computing at that stage. Yeah. No cloud. Yeah. And so there's this whole thing about, you know, there was, we were always playing catch up with how do you, you know, the files were getting larger, the resolutions and things were getting bigger, but the backups were getting, you know, increasingly hard to come by and more and more expensive because of the, the jump in resolution was faster than the jump in storage. And so, you know, you're just playing this game all the time. And, mm. you know, so I look back and when people think about some of the stories, and I know if you go back in the days of an early wetter and when they would be literally flying people over the files and putting them on planes in the evening to fly into L.A., and people would go down into the Auckland water, um, waterfront when big cruise liners came in, the big boats, yeah. and actually hotspot off their Wi-Fi because it was satellite. <laughs> and so you'd sit with a laptop and you'd be using this, this connection that was faster because they had to have satellite on the boat than what we could get through dial-up. That is amazing. So insanity. And it was yeah. only, and a lot of this happened 20 years ago. You know, it was in the time frame of my, my children. Like they, mm. they were born into this time when we were still slow dial up and where I lived rurally outside of the city it was you know actually a satellite connection and we had a, a total of three gigabytes a month wow and what do you, what do you like look back on fondly and think that those are the moments that helped me actually to the person I am now look I, I look back when I left there and it was just under 8,000 students had gone through and, and had become qualified <clears throat> and and I look back with a huge pride on that because I think what if in that moment where, where you know, the decision wasn't made to create that institute, and, you know, Media Design School is still an institution it's own right now and it's very successful. You know, what, what happens if you didn't and what would have happened to those people? Where would they have gone? And, mm. and actually the same thing now where my – so Academy X is an evolution of the Mind Lab and Tech Futures yep. Lab, and it's been a – which I'll come to, but we're about to celebrate our 10th anniversary. And in that 10 years, very similar numbers – it's almost probably identical numbers – uh, have have been qualified, uh, albeit in you know postgraduate level as yeah. opposed to undergrad, and and you do have this moment of there are just literally thousands of people out there who have gone on to do amazing things, and there in, in my LinkedIn I'm literally blown away by people who we were teaching 20 years ago who are literally across the world running these global companies and startups that they've turned into these multi million dollar massive success stories and I'm like wow going back far enough there's an inkling of you know we sort of saw those rock stars as they came through but you yeah. just watched their trajectory to where they went to if you're in education you you can't help but get super excited by yeah. by that knowledge that there's a little piece of it that perhaps sparked when they were learning with you that took them on this journey to just this these great heights mm. and, and that never stops and they reach out and often you know you just get these amazing messages and I probably get one once a week where there's just someone saying just checking in to let you know what I'm doing these days and that's cool that's really very cool, cool. Yeah. Like, and and that's for me is like an addiction it's like this addiction to learning and getting people on that journey uh you know so that you, you really have this sort of point of view where you sort of sit back and go you know decisions you make 
sometimes you, you are so isolated from what happens next. Mm. And I'm sure for anyone who develops software or anything else that the same thing when you start to realize the impact it has on people's lives. And yeah. I love that about learning. You can, I can look someone in the eyeball and go, tell me your story. And they can go back to the point in time when they made decisions, which you may have had an impact on. Mm. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So you, so you finished up there as the CEO and then you decided to go again and and start to build something again. What happened to you? Did your, did your was your mum still working? Was no, she had retired by that stage. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Didn't go. It's all mum's. <laughs> no, no, no. So it was so sold. Yeah. It was sold to a US group. Um, it's since been sold to another US group since. Um, so I actually spent the last three years when I was there setting up equivalent institutes, what we call a box within a box, in the American terminology, which was like pick up media design school and pop it into other other institutes around yep. the world that they, other universities they owned. So um, we started with one in Santa Fe in New Mexico and we're in San Diego, uh, Milan, uh, and then they were going into Malaysia and Australia when I sort of left at that stage. And they're part of a, a big global group now. Mm. Um, and, and and so, you know, I had sort of three years of, of that kind of exciting work as well because I've been out of the country kind of really playing into this global space, which really gave me the idea about the next business I wanted to, to form, which was uh, the Mind Lab. Yeah. Which and did was, you straight into that or did you take some Yeah, I, I had three months between Yeah, um, just forming the team. I managed to have, of course, I had a really huge community of incredible talent that I knew because I taught them. Mm. <laughs> so that I was like, okay, I want one of you and one of you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and actually the, the initial team, I think, were eight of us on day one uh, when we started. And, um, you know, we, we basically – started in a shared office and we were looking for space and there's another whole side story. We, we'd actually signed up in a formal lease in the Winyard Quarter before the Winyard Quarter was at the very beginning of what it was going to be. And so the, the grand plans were there, all of the, yeah. the, everything was there. The contract was signed, the lease was agreed, the, the fit out team had designed all how we were going to be. And then they turned around and said to me literally a week before we were about to move in saying, Hey, um, Halsey Street, which is the entrance of where our building was, we're about to rip it up and put in a whole lot of pipes and a whole lot of stuff. And I'm like, well, how do we get access to our building? They're like, well, we're going to have to do some kind of covered walkways from behind the building. And, you know, and I said, well, how long is this going to be for? And they said, oh, three years. <laughs> and we were just like, how do we get out of this lease? And so that was a really tricky because, you know, every dollar is tight. Yeah. And suddenly I had to get legal to get me out of a lease for something that had never been disclosed. And so it was like, who said, she said, did they, you know, so. That's not a great way to start a business. It to, was a terrible yeah. way. And, yeah. and then we had to find a new location and, you know, so forth. But um, so we started and the idea of the Mind Lab in 2013 was I was fascinated that my children, who at the time were sort of early teenagers, were, I was saying, why are they learning the exact same things as I did. Mm. This is crazy. I've just been the last 14 years at sort of at the forefront of, of, you know, education and technology and suddenly I'm back into looking at them bringing textbooks home. Yeah. And I was like, this is, there's got to be a better way. So the initial premise was, how about we bring in kids between the age of sort of 7 and 12 in their school years and come in as school groups and we'll teach them all the stuff that I've been teaching to adults for the last 14 years. So awesome. they will learn to code and to animate and to do, you know, game development and all sorts of stop motion and fun mm. things. And, and, and that was incredibly um, timely because suddenly schools were really interested in this creative output. So we're looking at new ways. Technology was becoming a little more accessible. And so that grew really, really quickly. And we went Auckland, then we opened in Tarapiti and Gisborne, Wellington and Christchurch. Mm -hmm. And school groups would just come on buses and... You know, we'd come through, they'd put it part of their, their learning experience of their, of their school. And then the story is, you know, one I've told many times that we had these teachers coming in with these students saying, this is awesome, love the engagement of these kids, they're so into this, we have no idea to replicate this back in the yeah. classroom. Like, yeah. how do we do it? And then that was the kind of the aha moment where I was like, okay, we need to teach teachers. Mm. And having come out of a tertiary environment with be to design school, I knew exactly how to do that. What I didn't know is how would I find a way to get formal qualifications quickly mm. because that's a very long process. Yeah. Like you can't just go, oh, I think I'll create a postgraduate certificate. Yeah, like boot camp for teachers. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be, you know, it's a whole NZQA funding. Yeah. It's a very regulated, compliant sector. And so I had to think about what would that look like. And what I did at that time was I partnered 
and in, into, into a partnership with Unitech mm. as New Zealand's largest polytech at the time, or still is, under Tipu Kinga. And so pre Tipu Kinga, so I went to Rick Ede, the CE at the time, and said, look, this is what I want to do. And he was like, this is awesome. It fits with what we're doing. We've got a program, a postgraduate certificate that we think framework will work really well with what you want to do. Let's work with NZQA. Let's do this. And we so we created the first qualification, which was a postgraduate certificate in digital and collaborative learning for teachers. Wow. And lots of firsts in your life, Francis. Like lots of first things. Lots and lots of first things. Yeah. And 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 we also had some really big challenges with working with NZQA because we wanted this the teachers to be able to submit their evidence of learning through things like video yeah, well. and you know and, and podcasts and things that were because it's the very nature of what we're trying to teach is like don't go back to writing essays. Yeah. And they were really great. They worked with us and we had had this ability to do it. But what was really amazing is a typical postgraduate class is around now 10 to 20 people. We put it into market and we had about four or five weeks before it started and we were like, do you think we'll get 10 or 20 people? And we got 250. And we were like, okay, we're onto something here. Mm. And then it just grew. It just went off. And then, of course, we we basically started looking at other types of learning and what are other sectors getting out of of true education and thinking about, you know, what does a banker need? Can yeah. we just put a pin in that for a second? What advice would you give to someone that's out there right now that's that's probably younger or, or it doesn't matter how old they are, I guess, that's thinking, how the fuck do you just jump in and create something, do something first time? How do you go against the grain? And what sort of energy and passion and thinking do you need to do something like that? Yeah, and look, I was in my 20s when I first, like me design school, I was still in my 20s. So, mm. so you know, they, I didn't know, you know, how I mean, I'd come back into the country. I didn't have networks and things. New Zealand is fantastic because you are only one phone call away from talking to the person you need yeah. to talk to. Yep. And I think there is an element of at any age, but when you're young, there is an element where you can be kind of bullshit because you can play into that because people have a, a great admiration for someone who sort of comes in their 20s and says, this is what I want to do. Can you help me yeah. to do this? Including government agencies, including the bank, including you know people you may need to talk to. I think there is an element of you can get doors open. Then you actually have to know your stuff. Like mm. you have to have a business plan. You have to be able to talk about how you plan to, to you know create revenue. But I think doing things first is actually easier than doing things second. Because if the person who did it first is amazing, then immediately there's a kind of a benchmark. Are you as good as them? Can you yeah. do it as well as they do? What if you're not as good? What if the market share is not what you think? So if you're coming in first and saying, hey, I want to teach people how to do animation, and they're like, what software does it use? And I'm like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's called Maya. And, and, and they're like, okay. And do you know anything about it? And we're like, yeah, yeah, you're bluffing all the way. You're going, yeah, absolutely. This is, you know, this is, this is you know, global world standard. Everybody uses it in the film industry. No one's no one knows any differently. Yeah. Like it literally <laughs> so there's an element of bluffing and naivety that kind of works, but you still need to know the business plan. Like yeah. it's so I, I think if you've got this idea, as long as you're actually solving a true problem. And that, you know, everyone will say this, but there are people you you know, I talk to and of course now we have um, you know, multiple thousands of students who are coming up with ideas every year right in front of me. And sometimes I'm just looking saying, but are you in love with the idea yeah. because it's just something you know or is it you've actually heard this being asked for, you know, people constantly saying, gosh, I really wish that there was something that did this. Mm. But I do think um, you, you just have to have, there's a little bit of tenacity that you have to have. I mean, I'm actually an introvert, so it wasn't like I wasn't comfortable going up to people and saying, can you help me? You know, I would much rather have just done everything from a back room and trying to do it on a phone, mm. but you realise there's a point where you just have to get out there. And I never once got one person who turned to me and said, this is a really terrible idea. Some people sort of said, are you sure? You know, I, yeah. you know, this is a big risk. People talk about risk in a way that now makes me laugh because everybody thinks everything is risky. That's not something they're familiar with. Yeah, if, if you go to people that have never taken risks and ask them, should I do this? Largely they're going to say no because they're worried about you. And they're exactly. sometimes the, the, our biggest roadblocks, you know, in terms of people that care about us telling us don't do it because I worry you might get hurt. 
you know, I think that there, you can find in everyone in their lives a time when they did take a risk, but often they don't see it because it wasn't a business risk. Mm. It could have been something physical risk, something in sporting. It could have been something when they decided risk to have, you know, love, risk in love. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think, you know, I always go back and try to find where people are saying, you know, when did you feel that adrenaline of risk taking that you did and it panned out? Yeah. And then tell me when it didn't pan out. And most people go, oh, actually, there wasn't a time when I did something risky and it didn't pan out. Mm. Most times... You know, you, you, if you follow that intuition, you follow your heart, you follow the drive, it takes you on a path to something actually that's really, really good. So, yeah. you know, there is a process, I think, that the more you take risk on and it works for you, the better you get at risk. You know, yeah. And that's why I think, you know, you have people who are constantly creating new, new entities and new environments and new businesses, because once you've done it a few times and you understand that, you know, debt is your friend and, and you understand that it's, you know, the worst that can happen as long as you stay you know, on the right side of the law and, you, and you're ethical and yeah. you do all the right things, actually, there's not much that can go wrong. Yeah, I, I find that if I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur, always starting companies and people laugh because whenever, whenever I catch up with them for a beer or coffee, they're like, what are you started now? Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, I find that I'm only comfortable now when I'm outside of my comfort zone. Yeah, I'm the same. And yeah, yeah it's, there's something crazy and stupid and lovely about that, but yeah. And, and for me, it is a little bit of... I love being around people who are really pushing boundaries, yeah. the conversation. So you know, I've just come back a couple of days ago from an experience in Portugal called The Dream. 500 people from around the world on a private um, home, which was a castle, as they, as they are. But 500 people who are at the very edge of the biggest breakthroughs in the world, who are like these incredible big thinkers. And, you know, I, I'm in these environments and, I, and and it was a holiday. So, you know, people go, even on holiday, you go and study? Like, you're crazy. But I just love when you throw yourself in these immersive yeah. environments with people with these big, big ideas. So the, the downside is every time I go away, my staff go, uh-oh. Here she comes back with something. Oh, no, there's going to be. And, you know, this afternoon, you know, even actually before I came in here, I was sitting in my car putting together some kind of images and things of, of of the experience so I can share it with staff this afternoon and I've got all these ideas that are coming from it and I think you know when you see other people who are taking even bigger risks like we're people who are literally at you know massive brains who are going out and doing things in some kind of really niche science and pushing things in genetics or you know in CRISPR technology or quantum or you know you've got people who are doing these really big expensive things that they can't even start what they're doing without a hundred million dollars in their back pocket yeah then you start going what am I worrying about you know I'm this little person on a, a small country on a tiny planet in a in our solar system and inside a universe like what am I really worried about I'm What's here for a nanosecond I'm here for a nanosecond yeah. and you know I, I always have that when I have that moment of Am I crazy? Am I? Am I? Should I be doing this? I literally zoom out way out into the solar system and kind of look back at Earth in my mind and go, like, "You're literally one of eight billion people." Yeah, split second. Do something. Do something that really makes you feel good. Mm. Do you think that does that feeling come from because you want to leave legacy, or does that feeling come from because you want to live in the moment? Both. Both. Legacy is really important to me. That I I don't want at the end of my life to have regrets. That you know that I had access to do things and I had privilege to do things and I had the brain to do things that I didn't. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, w- I want to make sure that my time here is meaningful and and I don't want that idea that I could have, should have, would have, you know, and I think people, you know, too many people I meet like that. You know, I spend a lot of time with people who work in corporates and they're coming out to learn and every day is a grind for them. Every day yeah. they feel they're not contributing. Never want to be that person. And I think the other one for me, living in the moment is – is, you know, you really do appreciate as you get older and your kids get older how fast life goes. And, and if you live for the past or you sort of think, oh, sometime in the future, then you'll never do it. Yeah. And so it is about today. And and I think for me, I actually the book I published last year called Future You was sort of focusing on you need to actually plan to do things every day so that you are, the future you is something that you're really consciously making a decision about. How much do you plan? Do you... Like in terms of if someone's trying to reinvent themselves or think about the next wave, do they just have a, a dream of a high level and then iterate to there or do they really path it out? No, I, I mean, I'm my way is one North Star, yep. go for it. Yep. And actually, you know, scramble along the way and you'll, you'll be wins and losses, but snakes and ladders yep. all the way there. But actually, if you, if you, I mean, I'm not a planner. Like I can't plan in that way because – things changed way too much and and also because I, I work in the in the very edge of technology so you know 
if you if you were trying to think last year, I mean, you you know, you just look at you know, generative AI. Is yeah. if you hadn't if you hadn't put that in your plan right now, you'd be in a bit of dire straits because yeah. you know. So you have to kind of go with the, the sort of the the swings of of what happens, and then. You know, I, I always laugh because you know you sort of go. Last year we were all talking about the metaverse and everything was in and, and NFTs, and it was all like yeah, it's all hype, 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 and then it goes crash down because generative AI comes in and and you know you watch stock prices change and and it, sort of the adoption curve increase, and then you kind of get the exponential effect. And so, you know, I, I always say to people, you know, you, you can't predict anything in this space. You know, it's yeah. and there's going to be things that will crash and burn fast and some will, will be slow burn and they'll eventually just take off and you'll go, wow, that, where did that come from? And there will be things that are just slowly come through and AI is a good example. It was very, very slow for many, many decades and suddenly, you know, it becomes accessible. You know, and we saw that with desktop computing. We saw that with mobile yeah. phones. We see that with, you know, so many things where it's, it's, it's very niche and then it becomes very expensive. And I always watch any form of technology or trend by the very super wealthy. So you find the, the multi-billionaires in the world and see where they're investing, you see what they're doing, yeah. see what they're wearing, see what they're in. You know, those people spend so much time on, on advisors and, and, you know, people who are analysts and they're doing, they, yeah. they've got all the resources at their, at their fingertips to make decisions. They are, they don't spend money kind of willy-nilly. They're not, yeah. they are very, very deliberate as opposed to, you know, people who might be, you know, multimillionaires who might be going, they're never aspiring to be a billionaire, so they, they, they'll take much bigger risks. Yeah. Billionaires don't. They, yeah. they are very deliberate. And I sort of watch in things, and there are so many things, and I'd be interested to see with the provision with the, the new mixed reality. Apple device now, yeah. do they get picked up by the super wealthy? Do, do they start playing in that space, or is it going to be another Google Glass? You know, so yeah, we'll it's, see. It's, it's an interesting one. What about going back a little bit on what you just said, what about digital humans in terms of like online education? Do you think digital humans will have the will people be able to empathise with a lecturer being a digital human? Yeah, look, I I think for a long time. I mean, we've had obviously early um, applications of that with soul machines here in New yeah. Zealand, but I think that even today, I mean, there's been millions poured into a number of companies who are doing really high end digital humans. Education has been democratised to the point where anyone can be educated now, which is amazing. Yeah. But obviously you can't have um, a, a specialist for every single kind of version of that. You do need, you know, you, you need to be able to turn the knowledge that is really powerful into a delivery mechanism that people can relate to. So they need to be able to speak the language, they need to be identifiably relatable, so it could be ethnicity, age, yeah. etc. So... You know, you might have the, the world's best deep expert on machine learning who's a 70 year old white man who speaks English. Well, that's no use to someone who's in Uruguay. Yeah. So let's make sure that if that's going to be content that we want to be able to communicate, let's make sure it's someone who's relatable to the student yeah. and has the, you know, the, the, the language, all the things, the cultural aspect. If, if they point at the sort of the, almost the uncanny valley, you can't tell the difference between, because you get lost in the fact that they're so believable that you forget that they're not, then... To me, that just makes education more accessible. Yeah, you know, too many people, um, you know, are being taught by people they can't relate to, and therefore there's no connection. They can't contextualize it. I think digital humans are a big part of that, and of course, that's so accessible now. Mm. In fact, it's terrifyingly accessible because you know it goes into that whole how does it work in a democracy when you've got deep fakes and three yeah. D humans and digital humans that are so believable that you literally, even with the very best detectors, cannot pick. Is this a real person or not? Yeah. Wow. So on that, so Academy X, which is your platform, how did that? So that's a collective of the the, the previous companies that you sort of yeah, founded. Yeah, it feels. Yeah. You know, so we started with the Mind Lab, and that was all around education, and then it sort of broadened into sustainability. Then we when we launched, uh, launched Tech Futures Lab, which is all around this cutting edge of technology for yep. business people, and so and both of them very similar kind of profiles, female skewed. Yeah. Um, which is education globally, female education across the world now is female skewed. Yeah. And our students are typically in their thirties and forties. And they go up to we have you know, even scholarships are over sixties and they're really coveted, you know, awesome. people lots of people in the sixties who want to get into into learning. And so when we had the Mind Lab and then Tech Futures Lab and then we launched Earth Futures Lab for more of our because we got more into the sustainability programs. We were like, well, this is getting really complicated in a market. And we were going into Australia and we we're like, we can't take three brands into one mm. market. And so Academy X was launched in January this year as the overarching sort of house of brands yeah. in terms of education. So we, so I we love now. The name, by the way. 
Fantastic. Look, yeah. it was a bit of a, a chance finding, you know, with, with trying to find domain names these <laughs> days. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah, so it's really a house of education brands. And yep. that's the brand now that kind of encapsulates everything we do, as well as what we call our partners lounge, which is our software as a service product, which yep. is we have learning management systems and we create content for large organisations and government. Yep. And so that's probably about half our business. So half is sort of education and some kind of form linked to a qualification or a micro-credential. And the other half is creating uh, these you know, SaaS-type products around learning management systems that people can, you know, 10,000, 50,000 people can learn on at a time mm. with the content that we create for the entity that they're wanting to teach whatever that subject might be or whatever that knowledge might be. It might be around yeah. the future of energy or it might be around generative AI or it could be about water security or it could be about compliance and anti-money laundering. It could be anything. Mm. Do you think traditional universities are going to be able to keep up with what's happening in the tech industry and the education sector? No. No, mm. and I think that because they have such huge overheads in their physical uh, environments. You know, there's a few things that work against universities into the future – one is the physical, the cost of maintaining yeah. campuses, and a lot of a lot of its destination is tied to a campus. Two, money is tied to research outputs, and so you know you, you really want as many people doing PhDs and, and doing doctorates, and so that they're doing. So there's a lot tied to that, which is a small percentage of people when you've got eight billion people, which are very young yeah. for the most part, or very old beyond university age. And so young people are, you know, they're, they're seeing learning as being much more short, sharp, we, you know, almost as you need it, yeah. and not about one block of learning for life. So that's going to be that's going to be really tricky. But also, I think this idea of you know anyone going into a physical and building, like going into a lecture theatre, is almost now been to the point it's been diminished into almost nothing, mm. um, to the point you know that that they're having to reinvent themselves as online learning like everybody else, but they don't necessarily have the technology background to understand what it is that, you know, an 18 or a 20 year old wants to experience online and what they're comparing themselves. You know, if you've got an 18 year old who's rest of their time online is spent in immersed in video games, social media, you know, it's very, you know, instant gratification, rich kind of content and lots of ability to kind of collaborate with others. And then you go into a sort of a linear online experience with someone talking Mm. into a class and sort of expect to take notes, that's not going to last very long. And, you know, the population is shifting globally. You know, we're getting younger. New Zealand's population is massively changing. And so it just within a very short amount of time, Pākehā New Zealand will become less than 50%. Māori Pacific and immigrant will become our biggest part of our population. So we've, you know, we've got a change that's happening in the very immediate future and we're starting to happen here in Tamaki Makoto faster. And so, you know, we need to engage differently because they are typically groups that don't have the highest participation in our traditional universities. We want them to be achieving and having the best possible chance to do yeah. everything they want to do. So new models of education are going to have to do that. And, and a lot of them will be, you know, homegrown and, and you'll have iwi who will create new forms of learning, for example. You'll have different cultural groups looking at ways of engaging them and, and you know, their, their kind of communities in ways that it's more meaningful. So I, I think... Everything we're seeing, you know, learning across the world, doesn't matter if you're in Oxford or, a, or a Cambridge or you're the London School of Business, it doesn't really matter. Everyone's going shorter, sharper, more relevant and highly engaging personal personalised education online. Yeah. What about those, if we look at those 50% old Pakia that went to university that are going, ah, oh, everything's changing, the kids aren't going to learn anything if they're not going and meeting each other and socialising. What do you sort of say to those type? type yeah, it's interesting because I have four kids between 18 and 25 and – they, just that differences of seven years, they have very different experience of, of digital because mm. my 25-year-old and my 23-year-old uh, basically came, were growing up at the end, end of the dial-up era. Yeah. Social media was only really at the latter part of their teenage years that was really kind of impacting on them. My 18-year-old is a heavy gamer, you know, absolutely into it. And he is the most social by far. He has so many connections globally. He is playing games with people all over the mm. world. He's talking to them, you know, he's got his headphones on. He's, you know, I, you can hear him. I mean, I mean, every parent has got a son particularly who, yeah. who's a gamer. Yeah. You, you know, they're, they're engaged. It's no different for me than I sat in the hallway in my home growing up on the farm with the phone, sitting there talking to my friends in the evening until my parents told me to get off the phone. <laughs> you know, we weren't face-to-face. -face. Yeah. You know, I, I think we just have to understand real relationships form online. 
you know, the, I think the stats, I don't know exactly what they are, but I know more people now meet online as relationships than in person initially, you know, through dating sites and apps yeah. and et cetera. And so, you know, we've become really accustomed to this idea of connecting on in, to, a, to a point where we can build genuine relationships and then we bring it into the real world and we kind of have this hybrid. Yeah. And I think we, we all do it. I mean, now, you know, most of us look at meetings and saying, do I need to go across town to do that meeting or could I do that here? And, you know, it hasn't, hasn't changed the relationships, but when we get together, it's so much better because, you know, you can get to hug them and kind of go... It's a real person. Oh, aren't you taller than I expected you'd be? Or you, know, yeah. you have that, and you have, and you sit down and, and have your cup of coffee. But we still go back to you oh, have a connection with them, right? Yeah, yeah. and you build back, and you mm. go, when you go back to Zoom the next week with them, you know, it's just like they're in the room because in yeah. the end you've got that relationship. The hard thing, if I go back to education, is you at some point have to meet in person. Now we are really big advocates that yeah. you need to spend some time in person, ideally up front. So that if you are going to go deeply into a fully virtual world of learning, you've already bonded physically, that you know each other, you've, you've eyeballed each other, you've sat down and broken bread together, so to yeah. speak. Because then then that, that it takes a lot less time to kind of build connections than, you know, we watch if people are doing fully online, it takes them quite a few weeks before they get each other's humour, that they'll... Is that just because of basic empathy? That when yeah. you've sat in the room with someone, you need to have this empathy and then... Like when you then meet online, you're you're a physical person now. You're not just this totally two D thing on the screen. Yeah, I think empathy, and I think connection is still. You know, we, as humans, we we have always been around contact and, and the ability. You know, just to see people in a three D real form feels quite different in a way. And I think, but the empathy part is such a big part of it. It's, it's like you you kind of have this connection that takes a bit longer, and I, and. You know, rules of engagement online are still being developed. You know, people still don't know when to to sort of jump in, talk over someone. Yeah. You know, the rules are sort of like, you know, hands up and not put your hand up and button and not and and then humour gets lost easily. And you know, yeah. actually, there is a me- an element of mediation that happens when you're learning online that you don't have in the real world because it's self correcting in a, in a real world. Like you'll get a whole bunch of people roll their eyes at someone who keeps asking dumb questions. As a facilitator or faculty member, you don't have to worry about that because they kind of self-regulate. Yeah. And in an online world, sometimes you actually have to step in and go, okay, let's just take a pause and let's kind of look at the rules of engagement. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And that, that takes a little bit more of a negotiation, which is not an easy thing to do um, yeah. sometimes because it can be quite confronting. Well, I think it's fantastic, right? Because like, if we look at um, EWE in particular, um, in regional New Zealand, like being able to access education, being able to access things that you're interested in and give people platforms anywhere in the country is fantastic. As an Aussie growing up, you know, there were so many regions in Australia that were so remote that they couldn't even get to, you know, good schooling and the yeah. likes. And now with online education and the ed tech, the way it's blowing up, it's, you know, we're inspiring kids anywhere and, and at any time. And that, that, for me, makes me very happy. Yeah, and look, I can, you know, totally relate. As, as someone growing up in a small town, when I started high school there, there were so many subjects I couldn't do that they just weren't available because they didn't have the teachers, a small school, yeah. small region. And so if, if I mean, I eventually I left there to come to Auckland to go to high school. Um, so I need to start my first part of high school there. But if I'd stayed there, the choices I had would have been seriously limiting. And so now... You know, people in small towns, you know, they can supplement their learning with all manner of ed tech products and mm. env- environments and courses, some formally provided by, you know, government for them, but also just the proliferation of just so many ed tech companies globally who are designed for every year level, every education system, every subject, you know, and then, of course, you find the rock stars who teach it the best. And, mm. and you know, I, I, I always think about 12-year-olds. I think 12-year-olds are the most magical people in the world because... Generally, they haven't had puberty enough to be really conscious of everything they do and say, but they're so smart that they've got this, I understand the world. And they are such great self-discoverers. They go out and they'll basically find a solution for everything they need to do, mm. and then they'll utilise it. So if you watch the way that they can self-learn, you know, the amount of time, even actually last night, I was leaving work last night, one of my staff was there with a daughter, and she was talking about, she was creating a stop motion video, and she said, oh, did you, did you know, how did you learn how to do that? And she was just like, rolled her eyes, and her mum was like, mum, you know, of course I know how to figure this out. I went and talked to my friends, and we went online, and we figured out the solution. And she was actually younger than 12, but it was just like this 
duh, like, mum, yeah. you, you know, like. I had this exact same thing last week with my son. He was like, his computer wasn't rendering fast enough for his online game and he, he was trying to figure it out, what was going on. And, and I said, oh, let me figure it out and I'll come back and I'm just going to do this thing downstairs. And I came back up and it was working. I was like, what the hell, how did you figure it out? And he's like, I went online and figured it out, Dad. Yeah, you know, like, like it's, yeah. It's exactly. Like, I love that. And, you know, of course, they're building their own computers and they're doing all this stuff yeah. and things that we look at and go, that's really tricky. You yeah. know, they just look at it, it's like making toast. Come on, yeah. like just, yeah. you know, figure it out. Yeah. And, and so that's going back to education. I think it's it's really challenging because now we've got this whole generation who go, well, I can find it faster somewhere else. I'll find it faster. And, and of course, that p- brings challenges. And we've seen record absenteeism in our, you know, compulsory education system. And actually, participation in tertiary is down at really low levels. And, of course, you're seeing it in the headlines with all the universities having to lay people off and things yeah. because of low numbers. It's a really interesting time for learning. And in this country, we have some really big challenges around people over the age of sort of 22 going back into learning. We have very, very low participants in the OECD. And so we have very low levels of achievement beyond the kind of the compulsory three-year bachelor degree. Well, so if we're thinking forward then, right, and if what you're doing now is going to be part of this legacy that we talk about of you know of your of yourself and your team that's putting all these things together. Where do you what, what do you hope that legacy is in the future? Yeah, so we are now uh, expanding into Australia. So we've just um, gone and taken those first big steps of bringing a team and getting companies registered and etc. There, and what we're really hoping is we take what we've learned here. We don't have any competitors in Australia, uh, which is you know, postgraduate education that's really kind of now contemporary, you know, on the, mm. non, on, on the nose and taking it into Australia as well. And then this idea that we want to do more at scale. Mm-hmm. So more, if, if we can't get a typical, you know, professional service firm to get their staff into learning, let's find ways where they can engage. So they're not going to go into a formal programs, so let's find ways of engaging them so that when they wake up tomorrow and go, how did generative AI take my job? That there doesn't come a surprise, that they've actually been yeah. on this journey of discovery and, and reskilling. And, and so... I mean, I'm seriously fearful that we have got our blinkers on here around how fast the world is changing. You know, wherever I go with all the communities online that I, you know, are connected to every day, we are sitting in a position where we've got so much to do right now in terms of knowledge that we need a massive upgrade. You know, it's literally, if there was a software that we could get kind of implant in each one of us, it would be like four versions ahead just to get to where the start line is mm. because we operate so much, you know, we've got, a country that is the biggest employer is the government and the second biggest employer is yourself. Mm. So, you know, the competitiveness to keep learning and keep going back into, into kind of engaging with new knowledge, it's not really a huge kind of ambition. So that to me is the big driver is if we want to keep playing in this new world with, you know, extreme weather and sustainability requirements and fast knowledge with, you know, the effect of AI, how it's going to affect on so many things and automation, then that's where all the jobs will be. And so we can't rely on our children to be the ones who come in and, and pick up all those jobs because we've got still a 10 or 20 year gap yeah. between them coming skilled and us having the ability to, to really shape what the next 10 or 20 years looks like. And so every part of my day is thinking about how do I get more adults to recognise how limited their current knowledge is compared to what they need to know to do good, smart decisions in their day job and forgetting the next job, but even today's job that, you know, strategically they need a lot more knowledge, a lot more data and the ability to have real insight to what's happening and foresight to kind of plan for it. Yeah, it's a really interesting time. I think I think a lot about that myself, right? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to ask you this last question that we've been asking people in season two. And so I, you know, I'm a big believer in knowledge and information sharing and that's part of my passion of doing this podcast in the first place is just trying to share people's knowledge and information so that we can all learn. Um, and so I've been asking people, what's the one thing that you would sh- want to share with someone, with a, with, with, be it a TED talk, be it a podcast, be a, a book or a person or a, or a thing? What's the one thing that you go, I'm going to put this in the show notes. Everyone should go off and check this out. Look, I think I mean, I'm a massive fan of podcasts and there's one that I always recommend to people who just – don't know where to start, called Hard Fork. Mm-hmm. Um, it's available on all, all channels. And Hard Fork is two um, New York Times um, journalists, and they look at the tech insights for the week, what's happening in tech, and in a really fun, engaging way, and it makes it accessible, but it also blows your mind every time because you're just going, 
what's next. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think if having a view into um, into the future is, is really easy to see through the US and sort of Silicon Valley type of view. And that's yeah. the other thing I'd recommend is I say often to people saying, okay, so let's just imagine tomorrow you have to move to Silicon Valley. Yeah. Now find your job. Go to the job boards, go to the websites with jobs and try to find the job that you can do that will give you the same rewarding experience of what you have today without having a massive back step, either financially or in terms of responsibility or if your job title is the same in that US job board, could you do what they say you need to have? Yeah. And that's a pretty sobering experience. So I think when you start to understand this world of where we're heading, because they, they, you know, and of course it's not just in the US, of course it can be in yeah. many other countries, it's yeah. just from an accessibility point of view, it's easy comparison. Yeah. And um, you know, I think, so sometimes I think it's about finding things that you can learn from and, and add to your kind of arsenal of knowledge, and sometimes it's a little bit of the stick, which is, I still have a long way to go to keep pushing myself, to keep learning and to understand what is what is coming down down the path. And sometimes it's the best way to see that is trying to find your own job right now and does it mm. even exist in a sort of a slightly more future-focused world. Mm, interesting. So hard for work. I'm going to definitely go off and look at that myself. And then just to follow up on that question, as someone who owns a recruitment company, I often have this conversation and we talk about the niche, niche levels of skills that you need to be to be hyper-successful. And so that's like the Silicon Valley thing is a good reference to that where – I think that because they have a better education system uh, in the States, in terms of technology at least, they, they can get nicher and deeper in their skills and become way more specialised. And so if, you, like if you're in the States and you have a pricing issue on SAS, there's no matter what town you're in, there's a, a, an absolute expert weapon that you, know, you can go and talk to that will totally. give you some time. And so do you think with what we're doing with this smaller bite-sized education is going to help people to get niche, like that skill set niche in their skill? Well, I think New Zealand is only solution going forward is to be as niche as possible. Do the weird polymers, do the weird kind of SaaS products that nobody else can do. We can never compete on the mainstream. So we, you know, Paul Callaghan, you know, the Callaghan innovation kind of concept is New Zealand does really weird things well that nobody else wants to touch. And so... You know, I think we have to kind of figure out like what is the smallest part of that big problem mm. that actually still has a million or 10 million customers who no one is solving for them because it's not a big enough problem for a, for a Silicon Valley company to do. And so I think when you start to look at the New Zealand companies who do really well, they do things that are really unsexy. Yeah. They do things that nobody else is like. No, in Silicon Valley, I don't want to do things around tax or accounting. Yeah. I don't want to do things around kind of these really niche little weird things. That's what we do well, and and actually, I think we should always stick to that. And it's been a you know, going back to Paul Callahan, it's what he keeps saying is for us to have a hundred hundred million dollar companies, and you know that was ten years ago, so they probably should be bigger than hundred million dollar companies. Mm. We need to be doing you know, he didn't, I don't think he said the weird shit, but that's basically what he meant. Yeah. It's the stuff that no one else wants to do, and to me, that's that's the kind of the kind of the really essence of what we are as a country. Lots of sexy people doing the unsexy work. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, on that note, hey, thanks for coming on, Francis. Such fantastic. a pleasure. And I'll let you get on and enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome. Well, Francis is off now and I'm sitting here contemplating how many people listening to this podcast might have, might have been educated through one of her facilities at some stage or how many people she's influenced or helped influence through what she's been doing. And so... EdTech is such an important technology. It's it's a, such a big wave of what's happening now and how we can immersify and, and educate ourselves online. Like things like podcasts and blogs and like reading information online is where I get a lot of my information. And so it's really interesting to see how my kids and other future generations are going to be going off and learning. And so I really enjoyed chatting and listening to Francis. I feel really em- empowered by conversations like that because it's just amazing to hear what such cool people are doing and you know I'm definitely going to try and figure out how I can get to that conference or that house that she talked about that was phenomenal um, and see if I can get myself a, a Guernsey or a ticket there and so hope you enjoyed it as much as I did I hope you're listening and loving to the love the podcast I hope you're subscribing you know I harp on about it but it's only through our subscribers that we're able to keep bringing this to you so please jump on whatever platform you're listening to right now and subscribe and then do me another favor share this podcast if you really liked it with some friends or go off and comment on one of the posts that we've done online or or like it and share it and do all the things just to help us keep building the audience And so have a great day, have a great night, whatever time it is you're listening to this. Thank you so much for all your your time and on this podcast and any others that you've watched and listened to. And until next time, take care. 
This podcast is produced by John Otaka from Empire Films.